separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build
Oh God, how we thank you for the blood of Jesus, the blood that needed to be shed for us to be saved. God, being sinners saved by grace, God, we, we think about Good Friday and we celebrate Good Friday and think about why, why do we call such a sad day what should be just a horrific day, Good Friday. But it's because we, we now have a hope in the future because of you sending your son. You loved us so much, God, to send your only son to die on the cross for us. Who are we but people that you just love, your creation? So God, we celebrate Good Friday, but Man, we are excited because Sunday, Sunday, Easter Sunday, we can serve and praise a living Savior. So God, we come to you today and we just pour on us, God, your word and your love and your grace, God. Open our hearts and our minds to you and your word. Father, I pray that if someone is here that does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would just open and hear your gospel, God. Experience your love. Experience your grace and your mercy, God. Thank you for loving us, God, so much to send a Savior that we desperately needed. And now we have a living, vibrant rock cornerstone that we can build our lives upon. So God, we thank you and we love you, and it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, amen. Amen. And so, you know, we want to make sure uh, today, certainly even beyond today, that we always keep Jesus at the center. And we have, we celebrate this weekend, and I think it's great. You know, we have Easter, um, Easter egg hunts. We did that. Um, <clears throat> Easter clothes, Easter baskets. You're going to have Easter lunch, um, all those things are good. 
But we always want to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is always Jesus. Amen? And that's our focus. And even beyond today, even this day that we speak much of Jesus this afternoon, tonight, and even beyond this, because that's what the empty tomb does. The empty tomb changes everything. Changes everything. And I want to, I want to talk to you today and just show us we can learn about how the empty tomb impacts our everyday life. What, what, is, what does this truth of the empty tomb, how does that play out in my everyday life? What difference does that make? And that's what I want to share with you today. I'm thankful that you're here. Thank you. Welcome to Grace Point, especially if you're a guest. We're glad you're here and worshiping with us today. Um, I, I do want to pause, and I, can't, I don't know if she's back in town or not, but, um, and I can't pick her up out there. If Beth Jilson's in the, it's Beth Jilson. Are you around here? If you're here, Beth, you must raise your hand. Don't hide from me. Okay. She's be here at 11. Thank you. Okay, so Beth Jilson, a member of Grace Point, her and her family, she coaches TWU women's basketball, played for the national championship on Friday night. Didn't turn out the way we wanted, but she played for the national championship on Friday night. So super proud of her, and I wanted to acknowledge her. Um, and just, uh, you know, just, gosh, she, it's an amazing thing. So thank you. I'll, I'll get her in the next service. So uh, I'll be looking for her. Um, truly, thank you for worshiping with us today. I, I want to share four things, four implications of the resurrection. There's certainly many more. Um, Luke 23, on Friday night, we went to the cross and talked about the crucifixion and uh, the difference that plays in our life. And then today we go Luke 24 um, and, and talk about the resurrection. Four, just four things. There's many more, but four ways that it impacts um, our life every day. So I want to read Luke 24, verses 1 through 12, and then we'll go back. And I'll just kind of take these apart fairly quickly, walk through these 12 and share some things with you. So Luke 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Amen? That's why we're here. That's why we are here. Remember how he told you. While he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Verse 12, but Peter rose <clears throat> and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. So four implications from the empty tomb, into our daily life today. Takeaway number one. If you're taking notes, and it'll be behind me on the screen, these scripture passages in these takeaways. Takeaway number one. First of all, we see from this, verses one through three, that God always does what he says. You can trust him with your life. Verses one through three. So Jesus, and we're going to see in just a minute, Jesus told them this was going to happen. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they prepared, and they found the stone rolled away. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So all along, we know this was God's plan. Jesus even told the disciples, we're going to see in just a minute, this is how it's going to happen. And it happened exactly the way he said it would happen. Now, when you look at um, Matthew 17, listen to this verse. So he's speaking to the disciples, and he says, as they were gathering in Galilee, so talking about the disciples, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Now, look at their response. And they were greatly distressed. God's plan sometimes does that in our lives. 
I'm sure they were. Now remember, when, when uh, he's speaking to them, it's pre-resurrection. We're post-resurrection, obviously. So now, you know, we get the whole story. They didn't have that whole story. That's why when he went to the cross, they scattered the disciples. They were scared and they say, this on the cross, our Messiah, that's not how, we didn't plan it. That, that's, that didn't look like a good plan. They were distressed about what was to come. And sometimes I would say, maybe even for you and for us, that God's plan might be hard to understand. Or we might say, for your life, or we might say, you know, I have a different plan. I mean, how many, don't raise your hand, but how many, how many would say, yeah, you know what, Pastor Dave, my life turned out exactly the way I planned it. Probably not many, if any. But we can trust God's plan. Even when God's plan, we may not understand what his plan is for, for our lives and for your life. But the empty tomb says that well, he, we can trust him because he, that plan was distressing. That plan, we didn't understand. They didn't understand, but, but we see what was accomplished from, from that plan. I brought some pictures with me just like sometimes. Now, I'm not saying any of us would have a plan this bad, but sometimes, you know, our plans are just, they're just not good plans. And so I wanted just to show you some of these just for fun. Um, and these pictures are pretty self-explanatory. It's hard to see at the back, but this guy is standing on his kid's rocking horse, which is on top of an aluminum ladder, fixing a light over a pool. So let's look at the next one. Oh, that's not too bad. I could see myself doing that. That guy's on top of the door, and he's trying to paint the edge along there. I appreciate the fact no tape needed. You don't need to tape it off, man. Just eye it, okay? Next one. Oh, this is a good one. They're holding him by the sweatshirt. He's dangling over, and he's got his feet on rebar right there. Probably not the best plan. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes these are like, yeah, probably wasn't the best plan. What about the next one? Oh, no judgment on this brother, by the way. None. I'm not sure why I have that in there. Only judgment I have on this guy is I can see it's a, a dinky little 46. You got to go 70-inch TV. It'll fit. We'll get it home. That's the way I'd be. I'm not worried about how we'll get it. We'll get it there, honey. Okay, so not too much. Oh, this is my favorite. Can you see what that is? It's a trampoline, for crying out loud. Can you see that? So imagine them jump. I mean, ugh. I bet they were excited they got that thing up there, too. All right, what's the next one? Oh, that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> he has a bucket on his head, even though you can see the helmet right in front of him that he chose not to use. <laughs> this guy, hey, no sparks in the eyes. I'll suffocate in about a minute, but no sparks in the eyes. Okay, oh, this one, yeah. So some of you do not know what this is. I bet most of you don't. I aged myself with this picture. It's really hard to explain. I'll fail again in this service. I've had five chances and it doesn't work. But so this, <clears throat> back in the day, do people, anybody know what this is? Anybody? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. It's the over 60 group. Uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, I don't want to, I'm sorry. No, you're not. I am, but I'm, I'm sure you're all not. Young crowd, young crowd here tonight. Uh, so this used to be in public restrooms. Right, So you go to a gas station, after you wash your hands, you go up and you grab the towel and you wash your hands off, and then you pull it down and kind of recycle it for the next guy. So that towel, it's not like you get a new one, it just goes around in a circle. <laughs> and it dries. And then you, I mean, who, what were we thinking back? And I mean, I did it. I'm like, yeah, no problem. I mean, that was even way before COVID. We were like, now it's even worse. Like, oh my goodness. Thankfully, those, 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 you know, I'm not sure why, but they're just not around anymore. So, okay, then my last one's a favorite. That's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> you know, kind of got tired. I'm going to lean on my gun. <laughs> okay, probably not the best idea, you know what I mean? So, we, I'm not even saying that we have crazy ideas like that or crazy plans. Even, even if we have good plans, Right? And, and, and this is the balance we don't have time to dig into, but you know, God tells us we need to plan, right? But we always want to plan 
you know, with an open hand and under the authority of God because we want um, our plan to be consistent with God's plan. But here's the deal. Even if we come up with the greatest plan we can think of, God's plan is always better. His, his plan. So, so submit to his plan. It may not look like what you drew it up as. I'm sure in my family, my parents, I know, they were like, you are the last one we thought would have been a pastor of these children, and we have two girls. You know what I mean? I, that was not my plan. I never even, it never entered my mind. Literally never thought about it until one day when a, when a family member of mine came, took me to lunch and shared, you know, I, this is what I think, and then everything changed from that point. But I never, and it's been God's plan since. I never would have, but I'm telling you, I, I could not have drawn one up better. I know that. So, you know, obviously, I'm not saying everybody's called a ministry, but what, what that he has for you, it may not look like what you think it's going to look like, but when you surrender to his plan, he can be trusted. The tomb is empty, so that's as we can trust him. His plan is good. His plan is best. And so we want to surrender that, to that plan. And then as we do, what we're doing is we're trusting the sovereignty of God. It's a biblical doctrine. We talk about it at great point. That God is in control of all things. As one writer says it this way, the Bible is pervaded by teachings that God's sovereign control is complete and not partial. It's complete across all aspects of your life and my life. It governs every aspect of nature, every aspect of history, personal life, nothing, absolutely nothing is outside God's sovereign covering. Everything in your life, man. Everything in my life. So we can, we can trust his plan. He always does what he says, his word. He always does. So we can trust him with our lives. So surrender, we surrender to God's plan. Again, the empty tomb tells, hey, the cross, it may look different, but he does what he says. He can be trusted. Six words. This is from author Nancy Guthrie, uh, just a great author, and, and, and I read this a few weeks ago. Six words that help us as we're, you know, walking through God's plan, as we come into things that may not, oh, that wasn't what I planned, or that's these six words, and I hope God brings them back to your mind. Um, I can trust God with this. I can trust God with this. All kinds of implications. For example, I can trust God with the timing of my loved one's death. I can trust God with this. That wasn't my plan. I don't really understand, but I can trust God with this. I can trust God with the way my loved one died. I can trust God with the unknowns about my future. I can trust God with my unanswered questions until faith becomes sight. I'm in his presence. I can trust God to heal my hurt, my heart. I can trust God to speak to me through his word. I can trust God with this because the tomb is empty. He does what he says. You can trust him with your life. Take away number two. We go to verse four, where we left off, through seven, while they were perplexed about this. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. So take away number two from that, and this is, these are all for me, two for us. We have to stop looking for life in dead things Jesus is alive, and he is always the answer. We, we have a, even as believers at times, right, we have a tendency to do this. We, we look for this satisfaction. We look for this fulfillment in things that are created, and we're, we're looking for it in the things God created that they can never deliver. So all the created things in this world will never deliver what only God can deliver in your life. So we have this God-created void in our life. God created it, so God is the one to fill it. And so what we do then is we, we recognize that void's there, and so we try to start filling it with other things, right? Created things, worldly things. And we find out that those things never deliver. Even if it's just, even if it's just for, for, uh, temporarily, maybe some of those things deliver temporarily satisfaction. 2021, 
uh, I got a new truck. I'm 21. Man, I love those new trucks. You know, there's nothing like driving that thing. I was loving my new truck till I got my first new truck payment. I didn't love it so much. <laughs> you know, that happens. And then, I, you know, maybe this happens to you. I don't know. Maybe not. After about six months, I'm driving, and then I, oh, there goes a 2022 right there. That is so much nicer than my truck. I need that truck. Right. And they even, thank you, from the mouth of babes, man. Not my wife, the children. <laughs> so as I'm, as I am, I see that. And then we pull up. Uh, to a stoplight, and, and Karen, my wife's with me, and it just so happened, probably not God, maybe God, maybe Satan. I'm still not sure to this day. <laughs> we pull up, and, and a tw- it's right next to a truck just like mine, but it's a 2022, and I say to Karen, look at that, honey. Look at that truck. That is a 2020. I need one of those. She looks over. She said, that's exactly like the one you're driving. I said, no, it's not. Look at the wheels. <laughs> look at the rims. And if you could look in their car, you would see that that screen right there, way bigger than mine. 15.7, 15.3. And you know I need glasses, so for the sake of my safety, we need a new truck, right? So then you know how this goes. It could be anything. It can be, you know, clothes, house, just whatever. So if if I were to, by the way, if you were to leave today and see my truck, for the record, I'm still in a 2021 beat-up piece of junk. But one day... (laughs) You know, one day, God's going to give me a new one. Maybe 24 is the year, or 25. I lost my train of thought there. I really have, and it usually comes back. It's really... um, Happy Easter. Glad you're here. Glad you're here, man. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. Um, Okay, so anyway, so those, you know, those things are never going to satisfy and fulfill, right? Like what God does as much as we try in these different things. Now, look, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, you shouldn't, uh, if you want to get a new truck or, or, or new clothes or house, I'm not saying, you know, buying those things is wrong, right? Ultimately, that's pretty you got. But what I'm saying is where we place them in value and what we expect from them, right? We expect these, and this happens with people too, by the way. A whole other sermon, right? Especially in marriage or in marriage is that we expect people to provide and fulfill us in a way that only God can do that. Now, that doesn't mean you get a license to be a jerk, you know, husband. Just be like, I can't be what God does, so just let me be me. I'm not saying that, all right? But I am saying, like, sometimes we put that on people. When when the, the truth of the matter is only God, and so my thing is, hey, the tomb is empty, man. This changed everything. Go all in following Jesus. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. And that's where, our, that's where our heart needs to be. Not the things of the world, not in created things, but in the one who created all things. You've probably heard this uh, from John, a billionaire. Billionaire John Rockefeller was asked how much money is enough. And he said, well, just a little more. Just a little more. Now, one of the things God does, we know in his um, meeting our needs and, and fulfilling our you know, purpose and satisfaction in his life, and he, he does that. The problem is, we, you know, I think we just don't trust him enough, and so we don't commit fully. Right? So we don't ex- one of the things he does, he, he gives provision, um, and he's a very personal God. This on this screen, and, and again, I'm sorry, for the, in the back it's hard, I know. But this is Psalm 23, and the uh, personal pronouns are circled. And if you would count them, you'd find 28 in Psalm 23. 28 personal pronouns if you go through Psalm 23. I, I wonder if this is why um, Psalm 23 is so universal, is because it's so personal. That's the way God is. Right? I, if I'm doing, I can be doing a, a uh, graveside service or a funeral for someone that doesn't know the Lord and, and they're lost, they don't know Jesus, and the people there, for the most part, don't know Jesus. I start reading Psalm 23. I hear, I hear even lost people saying it after me. They know that means that it's, 
I think it's because it's so personal. And that's what we desire, right? Right. So this is what God, this is what God brings, what he gives to us. So, so we stop looking for life and dead things. And that, that fulfillment, right, is only going to be found in Jesus. The empty tomb proves that. And that's where we find our purpose. Takeaway number three. If we go to takeaway number three, go to the next verse, verse 8 through verse 12. Um, the empty tomb changes everything. Belief determines behavior. So look at verse 8 through 12, and that, you're going to see that play out in two scenarios here, um, in Peter and the rest of the disciples. Belief determines behavior. And they remembered, verse 8, his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So what we know is those guys did not move. I mean, literally. But verse, because belief determines behavior. So same thing with Peter. Look at Peter. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Why? Because he believed. So belief determined behavior. He took off. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So what you believe, and this is across the board, but we use it in the context of the resurrection and about Jesus, what you believe will determine, does determine your behavior. Peter believed. He responded by running. The others didn't because belief determines behavior. So then the question kind of begs the question that I'm asking in all these services is getting to the gospel is what do you believe about the resurrection and then what do you believe about Jesus? <clears throat> Let's go together. What is it that you believe? Because your belief about who God is is foundational to how you live your life. Belief determines behavior. Watch a person's behaviors, how they behave, to understand what they really believe. And I would, I would argue that even in the scripture I see this, that even um, the devil knows this. He reads our behaviors. And as he does it, that shows what's in our hearts and in our minds. Because what we believe determines how we behave. It, which takes us to the, to the last one, takeaway number four. This is kind of where we started, and this is where we'll, we'll end. Um, it's the gospel, and we believe that Jesus is always the main thing. So we keep the main thing the main thing, Easter weekend and all throughout the year, because that tomb is empty. It's not just empty on Easter weekend. It's empty every single day of the year. Amen? So let's watch this gospel message and continue to worship this morning. Before the dawn of creation, there was the Word. Before the beginning had begun, before the planet spun and the sun hung in the sky, there was the Word. He was the light, and the light was alive, giving life to all things, everything. No thing was created except through Him. And in His image, He created them, us in his likeness to reflect the light and be just like him but sin came on the scene and everything went dark not even a spark left we were hard pressed for a savior he had offered us his love in exchange for our trust but we could not live up to his standard of perfection we were dejected broken hostile hopeless but this is the gospel we put our hope in, that God, in his endless wisdom, fashioned the word into flesh, and he pitched his tent in the midst of our mess, and the rest is history. The mystery of the cross, the incalculable cost of his life in exchange for our imperfection, the beauty of his resurrection, giving us life in exchange for his death when we call upon his name, Jesus giver of grace, purveyor of peace, master of mercy, the word, the one who bore the scars that we deserve. Have you heard the gospel, the good news, not what you can do for God, but what he has done for you. It is finished. God's plan
planned since before the beginning, the greatest story ever written, broken by sin but restored when we surrendered to the word. This is the gospel. Have you heard? So in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus says this, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my, of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. That is what separates him from mere mortal man. That is what proved that he was a God in the flesh dwelling among us, John 1. And that is what shows, again, that the resurrection is real, that he is alive. But he says here, no one takes it from me. I lay it down, but I have authority to take it up again. Now, mortal man can say, anybody can say here um, that I lay down my life. But no one can take it up again. And that's what, that's what Jesus did. Proving he was God. That everything, so that all the prophecy, Old Testament, everything is all fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus. Everything is true. And so the gospel message that we know is truth. Because he did exactly what he said that he was due and the prophecy was fulfilled. So as we kind of bring this to a close this morning, this is the moment here. Everything points to this right here. All weekend long. Everything points to this gospel message. And giving you an opportunity if you've never made that decision to pray in just a minute between you and God and to ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior. It all points to this. All five services, we always end with this, this weekend. The gospel message, what you've just seen, what you've heard, what I'm dialing in on this morning. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I have, you have, we're born sinners. Genesis 3, sinners of the world, Adam and Eve, choose to, to eat from the tree of not, uh, knowledge of good and evil. Sinners of the world. That separates us from God. Sin is when we're disobedient to God. Right? So it's, it's as though in our mind, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's, it's we're on one side, God is on the other, and this chasm this bit, is created because of sin, because he is a holy God. He is sinless. And then Romans 6 says, the wages of sin is death. We die. But the gift of God you can't earn it. You can't work for you. The gift of God is eternal life. That's heaven. In, here's the way, Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's in Christ because Jesus died on a cross for our sins. And then John 1, it says, to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus dies on a cross for our sins, so he makes a way for us then to come into the presence of God in a place called heaven when we leave this life. So here's the question for you that every one of us need to answer. If, I mean, it, it needs to be asked. If you, were to, if you were to die tonight, do you have the assurance that the moment you close your eyes in death, you would open them in the presence of God in a place called heaven? Do you have that assurance? And if you don't, you, you can leave here based on the authority of the scriptures. You can leave here with that assurance. It's the gospel message I just shared. And we want to give you an opportunity to respond to the gospel as you've heard it preached and you've heard it, I've just shared and what you've seen to give your life to Christ. Which many of you have probably already done that. Then you're praying for those who are here who haven't made that decision or those watching on live stream. This can be a life-changing event, the day that you surrendered your life to Jesus. Would you pray with me as we can draw to a close with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed? And I am going to say a prayer based on the scriptures, this gospel truth, this gospel message. This is not Pastor Dave's idea. It's not Pastor Dave's word, man. This is straight from the Bible. The gospel message in this prayer that will lead you in surrendering your life to Christ. Asking Him to be Lord and Savior. And if you've never prayed it with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, then I'm going to pray and just silently where you're at, just silently between you and God, 
You can repeat this prayer after me if God's drawing you to him. Others, if you, you know the Lord, then you're, and you're praying for those here that don't know Jesus, that God would draw them. So with our heads bowed, eyes closed, if you've never prayed that prayer and you want to have Christ as Lord and Savior, I invite you to pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess, I know that I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes in life. And I need a Savior. And today, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart you, Jesus, died on a cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose again, proving you were God. And today I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. In your name, I pray these things. All God's people said together, amen. Amen. Look right here for just a minute. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. We're going to have some Grace Point leaders down here at the front. We would love for you to come just to share that you made that decision, and we're just going to pray for you. If you're visiting and you prayed that prayer, and as you go back home, let me encourage you to um, to get involved in a Bible-believing church. Connect with those that you know are believers. Share your decision with them. Share your decision with the pastor of a local Bible-believing church. And if you're here in this area, we would love to be that church. Obviously, come alongside of you. Just encourage you as you begin your new life in Christ. We'll be here at the front. We'd love for you to come and share that with us. I'll be at the back door if you're a guest, too. I'd love the opportunity to meet you and just to thank you for worshiping with us here at Grace Point. I'm so thankful for uh, you being here, spending Easter morning with us and worshiping. You're starting your day off well, and I pray it's blessed the rest of the day. Let's stand together, and as we do, we're going to sing together as we continue to worship the Lord.
join us in worship. I hope you guys have a good day. Uh, remember, we have prayer available up front if you would like. Um, walk in his light this week. Good day.